And then he says in verse, that I may know him. I just want to know Jesus. That's what we want for you. We want you to encounter Jesus. We want you to encounter Christ in such a way that not only do you know Jesus, but that you get to know yourself. And, and you learn that you can be forgiven. In Acts chapter 2, beginning of verse 37, it says, They were cut to the heart and said, What shall we do? They realized that they had sinned. Then Peter said unto them, Repent and let every one of you be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and you'll receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. There needed to be a change. An awareness of yourself happens when you actually encounter Christ. You begin to realize that I'm not all I ought to be. If he is who he appears to be, then I'm certainly not all I should be. In 2 Corinthians 13, verse 5, it says this, Examine yourself, test yourself, do you not know yourself that Jesus in, is in you unless you're already disqualified? So this process of getting an encounter with Jesus not only helps you to know him, but it helps you to know you, and it makes you want to make changes. So we made the decision, which is you, and making you first. But we really want you here, and we want you here because we want you to have an encounter with Christ, to know Christ and know yourself. Second little lesson. We want you here because we want you to have an experience. That's right. That's what I said, an experience. I believe you can't follow Christ without really having a special experience. You, we want you to experience life changing promises it's transformational that's the reason that's actually in that little saying we say every week it transforms us in acts 2 verse 38 it says for the remission of sins and you receive the gift of the holy spirit and verse 39 says for the promises to you and a lot of people think the promise is just salvation but in that text that's not so the promise in that text is predominantly the Holy Spirit. Salvation allows the Holy Spirit to dwell with us. Just as God always wanted to dwell with man, the goal from the Garden of Eden is still for God to dwell with and in us. So he, the promise is the Holy Spirit that we'd be saved, of course, is essential for that to happen. And that those that gladly received his word were baptized. And, of course, the Holy Spirit came to dwell within them. In Acts 1, verses 4 and 5, it says this. He commanded them not to depart from Jerusalem, but to wait for the promise of the Father. What is that? Verse 5, he says, For you shall be baptized with the Holy Spirit not many days from now. That's the promise. It's not just salvation. That's wonderful. We want you saved. But it's also God's Spirit living within you, which is communion with God, which is the big thing. That's the thing. So we want you to experience this life-changing promise of God's Spirit living within you. That's big. And we want you to experience world-changing power. It says in verses 42 and 43, and this is amazing, it says, They continued steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and the breaking of bread and prayers. That's the world's different there that churches even exist and continue to. Verse 43, and fear came upon or all came upon every soul and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Now we don't have apostles running around today who have special abilities, but we still believe in world changing power that God is exercising all along. What kind of power does God exercise? Well, the most important one is to save, Romans 1 and verse 16, for I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation for everyone who believes. Well, that's critical, right? You want to be saved, you want to live eternally. But then it's also to raise us from the dead. And that's a power that actually works within you even now. Ephesians 1, verses 19 and 20, the exceeding greatness of his power toward us who believe according to the working of his mighty power which he worked in Christ Jesus when he raised him from the dead and it will raise you from the dead. That's powerful because right now we can't do anything about dead folks. Nothing. But more, there's a world changing power to answer you and your needs. In Ephesians 3 and verse 20 it says, Him, God, Him who is able to do exceeding abundantly above all that we ask or think according to the power that works within us. That means that God is able to answer our prayers. You can't ask something too big. Now, he may not give it to you because it wouldn't be good for you, but you can't ask for anything too big because he's got that kind of power. 
And also, it's this world-changing power not only to answer our prayers, but to assure our hearts. 1 Thessalonians 1 and verse 5 says, Our gospel did not come to you in word only, but in power and in the Holy Spirit and in much assurance. One of the most important things as a Christian is to have assurance of your salvation. If you're in the middle of the night, like 12, 1, 2 in the morning, and you're having heart trouble or something like that, you don't need to be panicking. Amen? You need to be able to, if you need to, just turn over and go to sleep and meet Jesus in the morning. Amen? You need that reassurance. Well, he provides that through his Holy Spirit. And then there is that power to embolden us, even in this life. In 2 Timothy 1 and verse 7, it says, God has not given us a spirit of fear, but of power and of love and of sound mind. The reason that we can have boldness in the gospel is the Holy Spirit working in our life, that power. And it has a power to change us. In 2 Timothy 3, it says, having a form of godliness, but denying its power, and from such turn away. There are people who have a form of godliness, but they don't have the power because they don't actually have the godliness. If you are godly, that is the power of God that's made you godly. And vice versa is also true, that if you have godliness, there is a power around you. So we've made this decision. The decision is to put love and people first. That's the decision, not buildings. So we really want you here, and we want you to have an experience. What's that experience we want you to have? We want you to experience the promises of God coming true for you, and we want you to experience the power of God in your life. Even miracles happening in your life? Absolutely, God doing something special for you. Absolutely. Number three, we want you to not just have an experience and an encounter, but we want you to have an encourager. We want to be your encourager and to serve you. That's right. We want to do that for each and every one of you. Every one of us want to do that for the other. In Acts 2, verses 44 and 45, it says, Now all who believed were together and had all things common, and they sold their possessions and goods and divided them among all, as anyone had need. You see, people were first. Love came first. And that's what we want to be able to do for each other. Amen? In John 13, Jesus said this, verse 12. When Jesus had washed their feet, he said, Do you know what I've done to you? Do you really know? You call me teacher and Lord, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. We ought to be willing to wipe the drool from each other's mouth. Amen. Mark 10, 43. Whoever desires to be great shall be your servant, the one that's willing to do. That's love first. And we don't only, we, we want to be your encourager and serve you, but we want to be your encourager and know you. And I think that's comforting. In Acts 2, verses 46 and 47, continuing daily with one accord, that means they were together, and breaking bread from house to house, that means they were together. They ate their food with gladness and simplicity of heart, praising God and having favor with all the people. Not only were they getting along with each other, but they were getting along with people who weren't even in the group. And the Lord added to the church daily those being saved. Here's the deal. And listen to this carefully, because some folks don't like this. We want to get all up in your business. I don't want to know you casually. I want to know you. 1 Thessalonians 3, verses 1 through 5. When we could no longer endure it, we thought it good to be left in Athens alone and sent Timothy to establish you and encourage you concerning your faith. For this reason, when I could no longer endure it, even though I needed Timothy, could no longer endure it, I sent to know your faith, lest by some means the tempter had tempted you. Privacy is for the Internet. You keep your social security numbers carefully close, okay? Keep your credit card numbers careful. Be careful out there. Don't tell folks what your address is. Don't tell them what you do for a living. Be careful, folks. Out there on the Internet, you be careful. But here, and I don't want to know your social security number, okay? But I do want to know you, amen? I want to know you. We're, we ask intrusive questions, and if that doesn't suit you, this church probably doesn't suit you. I don't know what kind of church you're going to find and what kind of church you'd want to be a part of that doesn't want to know how you're doing. 
right? I mean, if you love is first and people are first, shouldn't we ask intrusive questions like, how are you doing? Oh, shouldn't ask that. Are you better if we knew you were sick? Are you better? Oh, you shouldn't be asking questions like that. Well, I want to know. You go in the hospital, I'd like to know. Amen? If you're sick, I'd like to know. I want to know about you. What can I do to help is the next question. Well, it ain't none of your business. I hope you don't have that attitude. But if you do, repent. I missed you last week. Oh, you just checking up on me. You better know when I'm checking up on you. If you don't want to be a part of a church that cares enough to check up on you, what kind of church do you want to be a part of? Anonymous or a church, you know, maybe there's one out there. Church Anonymous. Go there and sit and don't talk to me. But if love is first, and we really want you here, then we ought to get in each other's business a little bit. I don't want to tell you how to do things on there, but I would like to know how you do it. Amen and issue a hand. I remember there was a song back in the 80s. You remember this? Sometimes you want to go where everybody and they're always glad. That's a bar. <laughs> Let's own the mission. What is the mission? It's a decision. What is the decision? To make love and people first. That we really want you here and we want more here. That's the decision. So we want you to have an encounter with the Lord Jesus Christ. We want you to have an experience of the power, life-changing power, and God entering your life power. And we want to be your encourager to live that life. Read two stories this week. I'll share them really quickly says a lot about what I think people really want to be about. Captain Mike Drowley, he's no longer a captain now, I think he's a major or something like that, but he, his call sign was Johnny Bravo. Johnny Bravo flew an A-10 attack warthog uh, in 2002 in Afghanistan, about a year after the towers fell. He was in Afghanistan. He's flying through the clouds. This is actually, can't talk about the mission. I don't know anything about it because it's still classified. But there were special forces on the ground and they were up in the mountains. And it happened to be at night and there was a storm raging. But they were above the storm. They're up, they're flying above that. And there's a moon up there. It's beautiful up there. But the men are down in the mountain and they only have, they don't have GPS. They don't have the coordinates then as we do now. And so they didn't know exactly where the bottom of the cloud was and they didn't know where the top of the mountain was and where the valley was. They had old Russian maps that they had to follow. So he's up there with his wingman and he's in control and he knows the special forces are on the ground, but they're doing a mission. They only took 22 men and if somebody doesn't watch them, they could all be wiped out pretty quick. So he decides, he, he, he just had this urge, he needs to get down there to where they are. The problem is, is that there is a mountain there and there's a valley and he's going to have to go down in a gorge between and he can't see that coming. He's got to go through a stormy cloud to get down. What courage it took to do that. But he, as he drops down and on his way down, he hears them saying, we are receiving fire now. So they're under attack. I don't know what those words were. I'm sure some kind of code you guys know. I don't know what it was. But as he comes out underneath the cloud, he is 1,000 foot off the ground, and there's a canyon wall over there and a canyon wall over there. He's got a narrow gap. He's flying in. Why is he doing this? Because 22 of his fellow soldiers are on the ground in desperate need. He has five seconds. Listen to me. Five seconds to do whatever he's going to do because he's coming up against the mountain and he's got to pull out. So he dives down in that five seconds. He finds out where they are. He has to talk to them, find out in those five seconds. And he starts attacking the target that's attacking them. And then he has to pull up. He then, what he has to do then, he has to go back up into that nothing. He can't see anything. Come back around, calculate it just right, and come back in that valley again. And then come out of the clouds. He has five seconds to fight. Five seconds he gives it until he comes back around again and he comes back through again. He does that over and over, not sure if he'd even come back up in the valley again. 
Not sure if he had come right back against where the, the mountain was. He is risking everything he's got for those 22 men on the ground. And each time he does that until he runs out of ammo and they're still under attack. He then flies back up to his wingman out there in the moonlight in the beautiful sky. And he says, follow me down. The man's scared. He says, follow me down. He puts him five foot off of his wingtip. They go through this storm and come out just underneath it in the storm happening below. Five feet flying through a valley and he attacks until they virtually, there's no attack left. He nearly uses up all of his ammo. Why would he do that? Well, Simon Sinek asked him that question. Why would you do it? And he said, they'd have done it for me. Why don't we have that, amen? People matter. You matter. Just in case you think I made that up, that's him. But this one's even more amazing. If you can't make that out, that right there is kissing, that right there. Yep, that's a man kissing, and I put it on the video, and it's in front of everybody. That's right. I want you to see a man kissing another man. Because what's happening there is that's Captain William Swenson, a Medal of Honor winner, who is under such attack with his hundred and something men, being surrounded on every side, receiving mortar fire, machine gun fire, and everything. And he had to stand out in the field because he couldn't get the helicopters to find him. They were supposed to medevac people out. First Sergeant uh, Westbrook, Kenneth Westbrook, was hit in the neck and he needed him out of there. And they were being shot from every angle and he stands out with an orange thing so the helicopters can see it, right? And fire coming all over around him. You know how I know this? The guy was wearing a head cam, a GoPro on his helmet. And it's, everything's filmed. That's how he got the Medal of Honor because we see what he's doing. He's under fire the entire time trying to get men out and, and keep fighting. He's fighting the whole time and trying to save his men. He goes over and he helps get Westbrook out. He pulls him in and the helicopter guy comes in, pulls him out, and they get him in there. And when he gets him finally in, instinctively, he wanted him to know. He said later, he said, I just want him to know that everything's going to be okay. And he said, I reached over without thinking and just kissed him on the forehead. And then he turned around and went back into the fight. Bullets whizzing everywhere. If we don't love each other enough to kiss each other on the forehead, we haven't made love first yet. We haven't put people first yet. I want to be a part of a church that puts people first. Amen? That puts love first. That's what we're trying to be. I hope you want to be a part of that. If you haven't made Jesus your Lord, and you need to do that, Taught that earlier. You've seen the text. You know what you should do. You need to repent and be baptized. But if you've done that, help us. Help us make love first. Won't you come while we stand and while we sing?